How you doing, folks? So one idea I've had is that I want to go over certain things I did in my long lecture. However, with the, uh, the webcam, with the, a new take and in shorter bursts. So for example, I'm going to cover the lighting artist roles that I put in my main lecture, but in a shorter bite-sized video um, and to expand on a few things. So you want to become a lighting artist. It's quite a mystical role. Um, so what are the different types of lighting art that are in there? Because um, there's quite a few. You've got at least three different types and then each studio can vary uh, those workloads as well. So let's get into kind of what this means. So I've done this chart and you'll have to give the webcam uh, cutting out a little bit of it. I can read that bit at the bottom uh, for you. So you've got three types of lighting artists. Two are quite common. Um, one is, a, I call it a unicorn. It's quite a rare role, uh, quite a complex role, requires a lot of coding. You could probably guess which one that is. Yeah, it's a technical one. So I've drawn this chart. I'm going to also release some of these slides uh, in their sort of PNG quality on social media as well, so you can have a, a closer look. So you've got your cinematic, your level, and your technical lighting artist. <clears throat> so... Some of these roles you do both in companies. Some of them you take from each role and you use that to get your breadth of skills. We call that a T-pose person. So if I T-pose, like T-Rex style, because uh, you can't really see. T-pose is basically the, the width of your arms is the breadth of your skills. So um, a common skill to have in your good breadth would be a PBR. So understanding PBR and how textures affect uh, albedo. Well, how sorry, how albedo affects the uh, the lighting that you do and the luminosity values of certain textures. And then you've got um, a lighting guy understanding how to light characters and environments and understand how to optimize. So they don't have to go deep into each tree, but having that breadth, uh, whereas the height is your specialism, which could be, you know, cinematic lighting, environment lighting, uh, technical lighting, and so on. So cinematic lighting artist, we'll get into that in a moment. A lot of sequences of stuff in Unreal. We'll use Unreal as a terminology. You're in sequence of quite a lot, lighting characters in various poses uh, and scenes, over the shoulders, close-ups, telephoto, wide angle. Level lighting, you're lighting uh, the world, the zone, uh, the area. And technical lighting, you're fixing problems, setting up lighting pipelines, uh, helping lighters do their job. Because when you light a portfolio piece and you're doing it to a camera angle, you're not going to run into too many issues. Now, when you light an entire game, and that game has streaming sections, reuse, animation, characters, combat, characters running all over the spot. There are a lot of issues that get introduced to do with lighting that you need somebody um, with a good enough knowledge of getting in there and sorting out those issues. Um, some are easy to fix, some you need a technical lighting software. And then you go up to your sort of management, high level positions, principal and lead. Sometimes lighting director can be above that. Uh, it's hit and miss. It depends. Every studio differs. And we'll go into each one of these. So I love using the images from uh, you know, the Ratchet and Clank stuff. So uh, this is uh, from uh, Insomniac. They have a lot of really good talks. Uh, and they get to show before and afters, uh, which is awesome. Because you don't really see that level of breakdown a lot of the time when you, uh, when you look at lighting portfolios. Because they don't have permission to do that. So... Cinematic lighter will like cutscenes. They might highlight parts of the environment in that cutscene. They uh, will ideally give the characters three to four point light setup, get a good material response. So on the the, the little robot lad here, um, you can see the reflection of the lights that are being used, and you get this nice metallic material response. Same with the earrings. You know, when we say material response, we usually mean the the juice the juice of the texture coming out, um, you know, that sort of roughness pop. We have the catch light in the eyes. The catch light is the way into the soul. So without the catch light, a soulless creature with the catch light, um, you've got a bit of a soul. And then you've got rim light, catch light, fill light, all that sort of stuff, really. That's what you basically make them go from looking ambient, where it's probably taking the environment lighting values and giving them a pop. So you can't just have environment lighting light up the character in a lot of cases you give you have to give the characters a bit of a pop with some special lights just like in a movie 
you can draw a lot of parallels to cinematography when you light. Um, they don't just rely on the ambient lighting from the world. They have soft boxes, bounce cards, all sorts of things um, that are off the frame of the camera to make it look good to go. Separate the character, so fog cards, place them behind the character or have a fog system that will help bring them up a bit. Depth of field does also help with this as well. And the lights will be spawned when the cutscene starts. So the lights aren't present until they uh, are activated and runtime by the sequence or by the cinematic. So that means you're not going to see the lights in the world. They'll be there only for the cutscene and then they'll disappear afterwards. So um, that's what we mean by spawning them in the uh, sequence that you're making. Level lighting. So ideally you want to have level lighting done before you go and do cinematic lighting because if you're changing the level drastically in terms of its art direction, your cinematic lights have to redo their work every time. And after a while it can get a, a little um, inefficient in terms of the bigger picture, you run into diminishing returns. So you set the exposure, the fog, the sky, the highlights, the grading, get it signed off, take it through iteration, you move in your cinematic lighters and then as a level lighter, you move on to another zone or maybe you stay on the zone and do a lot of uh, fighting of fires um, because the bigger the zones you light, the more areas that you have to debug. Maybe some areas get too dark and then you have to revisit the post-processing or the exposure. And maybe you need to adjust your exposure to be a bit more PBL, you know, physically based uh, with the lights. So, yeah, lighting the environments first and then going with the cinematics is uh, what I'd recommend. And uh, you want to put lights in a way that will help your cinematic lighters. So if we have a look at this area down here where I've got, uh, well, my friend Vasesh, uh, these are his pieces, very good. Let's say there's a lot of cutscenes down there. Now we could light that with ambient light in the sand dunes of Mars or wherever it is, or we could place a big sort of sci-fi light up here that cast down onto the characters. And because we've got that in the level, it gives a justification for the cutscene lighters to add a rim or key light up here, which in turn is gonna make the characters look even more cinematic and pop more. So the way you design your environment level with cutscenes in mind will lead you to better cinematic lighting and more tools for your cinematic lighters to use. So you're not just responsible for lighting a space, you're responsible for designing and thinking where these big beats in the uh, the story of your game are going to pop and making sure that you have um, lights in places that can justify having a rim light and not just having a, a random light in there for no reason. So those are some examples of how you would you know, synergize with cinematic lighters uh, in that regard. But yeah, you focus on the level lights. So you can do both of these. Sometimes level lighters will do cinematics, vice versa. Usually in bigger studios, they seem to separate them. Cinematic and level lighting seems to be different but it really depends. They share the same skill sets in terms of the breadth and the width of what you uh, need to be learning and applying. Next one is the unicorn, a uh, very rare role. So a technical lighting artist uh, does a lot of coding, uh, works in uh, Lua, Python, uh, in Unreal Blueprint, gets nitty and gritty going deep into the game's code, understanding how Unreal renders the frame, understanding the G buffer, and creates tool, color grading tools, tools to make lighting and uh, free the artist's life easier. Blueprints, cookies, you know, cookies, there are black and white textures that give the light a, uh, a sort of noise texture, which you can do when you're running out of shadow memory. You can disable shadows and use a cookie instead and fake it. These are the things that you'll see um, technical lighting artists doing. They are a very, very rare role. Um, I don't know many of them and you have to train specifically for it. So, uh, you know, this, this chap I've got here, Jan, uh, if you look at uh, their portfolio, they've got a lot of uh, lighting tooling from the Callisto protocol. And uh, that's a good example of um, you know, what a uh, technical lighting device would do. And again, all these roles, they, they will change in their responsibilities and they may slightly differ depending on the studio you work at. But these are just like the core um, skills that you can, you'll be doing, but what you need to expect when you go into a studio and start lighting. Baked lighting, dynamic lighting, you need to know both of them. And then you get into sort of your um, your higher level positions. So you go from junior, mid to senior. You stay at senior for a few years, and then it's time to either go to principal or lead. Now, the principal role exists because what would happen is 
your best artist or your uh, most seasoned artist that had been at the studio for you know, 10, 15 years would become a lead, naturally, right? But the thing about the lead role is your best artists aren't necessarily your best leads because the lead role is very people heavy, very team management heavy, very meeting heavy. You have to fight fires. You have to protect your team from, you know, overscope and all these other little things. You have to know when to fight your battles as a lead. Because if you um, say no to everything, you know, you're not going to be very good to work with, but there are times and places to voice your opinion on when stuff is getting a bit too crazy and when, you know, when to stay quiet. It's just one of those things of working in the games industry. You're going to encounter this in most, 99% of places you work, there's going to be this, you know, landscape where you have to learn to manage people. So they develop the team, help develop the artists in the team, give them feedback, act as a quality filter for the art director. So art directors are very busy people in a studio. So if you're sending work directly to the art director, it's got areas like you forgot a light somewhere or something's too bright, very sort of fundamental areas which can happen. Um, it's going to waste a lot of that sort of resource and time. So usually you will filter stuff through the lead who will review it. And then when the lead is happy with it, they will then filter it higher to the art director for sign off or iteration. So they can act as a quality filter. Uh, develop one-to-ones, develop the team, recruit for the team. And uh, you will not be doing much production work. You'll be looking more at the bigger picture of scheduling, working with your producer that's helping schedule you and your team and uh, fighting fires and working with art direction. So, uh, and now the principal role was created at least to my knowledge, it was created because um, when people move up from a senior, they want to move up in progression. So they're getting progression in their career, but they didn't like going from senior to lead because the management aspect of it and the sort of people aspect is not for everyone, which is perfectly understandable in an artistic industry, right? So the principal role was created and the principal role is essentially a role that focuses on quality and production and not the managing of people, not the sitting in meetings, being given more work to do, complex work, work that needs firefighting or solving, benchmarks. You will send a principal in early to design and iterate on a level that needs a specific look, whether it's materials, environment, or lighting. And they will work with the lead to get that signed off with the art director. And then once the principal has set those benchmarks, here's how a typical cutscene would look in X level. Here's how the environment would look in X weather. Um, once that's signed off, you can then disperse that level or slice it up into zones to give to your uh, seniors and mids. And this this goes for every role, right? Environment, art, lighting, you know, whatever you want to call it. They will set the tone, and then the principal will move on to other tasks where they're needed, which are you know the difficult tasks. They can be left alone to work on the, what they want to do. They've got a lot of experience. They probably done art for multiple games and multiple types of scenarios. And then your uh, your seniors, your mids, your juniors will work on the area that the principal benchmarked, but they will you know do all the other areas and like them themselves, making sure to stay to the wider art direction that's been defined. So principal focus on production and quality of work. Lead focuses on the people in the team. Both are incredibly important roles. You will know the difference between an efficient and inefficient lead. Um, when you sort of get into the industry. So that is generally the split of roles, uh, what to expect, what you can start to specialize in, and how the ladder uh, sets itself as you go higher. If you've got any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments, and I will uh, be happy to answer you. But uh, other than that, for now, peace.